All right, so today's speaker is Tillman Bauer from KTH, who will tell us about homotopy representations of Lie groups and two compact groups. Thanks. Oh, you're muted, Tillman. There you go, there find go. the controls. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to, um, to give a talk here. This is my, um, my second attempt at doing something via Zoom. The first attempt was just a couple of hours ago with a lecture, um, yeah, where I noticed that if you use the whiteboard feature, the whiteboards are going to disappear. Anyways, okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, homotopy representations of Lie groups and two compact groups. And um, um, in my experience there, when, when people start talking about p-compact groups or p-local finite groups, it can get very messy very quickly with uh, all kinds of definitions of fusion systems and central linking systems and so on. And um, I'll try to keep that part of the story to, to a minimum and focus more on the sort of hands-on computational things as well, I think is uh, suitable for this seminar. So um, let's uh, start with the definition. If we fix a prime, and uh, we start off with a compact Lie group, so I'm going to look at the classical case first, and then uh, I find a um, homotopy representation, and I mean implicitly a, a complex and um, dimensional p-complete uh, homotopy representation to just be a free homotopy class from the classifying space of G to be UN for some n, where UN is the uh, unitary group, p-completed. And um, well, obviously, if you have a representation, which for me is a homomorphism from G to UN, but modulo UN conjugation, um, then, that, uh, then you get a homotopy representation, but not all homotopy representations occur in this way. Um, just like the uh, ordinary representations, the homotopy representations form, uh, have a structure of a ring without negatives. Some people call that a rig under direct sum and um, tensor product. Of course, you have to take all the uh, ends, all the dimensions uh, together. And uh, that, that comparison map from the actual representations to the homotopy representations um, is a homomorphism for that structure. Um, another thing to note is that if G is discrete, so a discrete compact Lie group is of course just a finite group, then C is an isomorphism. That's just uh, covering space. Uh, theory. Um, but in general, it's not. And even if you stabilize, let n go to infinity, then you might think, oh, but then we're getting k-theory. But you're not. You're not even getting a ring. It's still a rig. And, and the reason for that is that maps into BU, um, that's only k-theory for compact spaces, and BG is never compact. So there is a, a completion involved going to k0 of BG. So um, <clears throat> obviously, um, if you have a homotopy class from BG to be UNP completed, that's the same as uh, a homotopy class where you also complete BG. So this only depends on the P completion of BG. Um, so let's look at an example. Let's take a very simple Lie group that's not finite. Let's take the, the circle. And um, let's look at the a chain of subgroups um, of all those elements that are p to the n torsion. So that's, those are cyclic groups of order p to the n. And if we take their union, then we're just getting a copy of, I like to call that group qp mod zp. Some people call it uh, z mod p to the infinity, but it's a, it's a discrete a divisible infinite group, but a, yeah, a discrete group. So let's call that g uh, check. And, um, just by looking at cohomology, you see that the map from this discrete approximation uh, to BG is a p-equivalence. It's an isomorphism in uh, mod p cohomology. So if you p-complete that BG uh, check, then that's the same as uh, um, p-completing BG. So if you look at the one-dimensional homotopy representations of that group by that uh, uh, by that argument, you see that this will be uh, a map homotopy class from the co-limit of all those B, C, P to the N, which is uh, in this case, just a limit of the homotopy classes of those uh, classifying spaces of finite cyclic groups. 
those are just regular representations. So you get the inverse limit of Z mod P to the N. So you get a copy of the P addix. Um, of course, the regular, uh, the, the actual representations of S1 are just indexed by their degree. So that's just the integers. And here for the P addix uh, homotopy representations, you get a copy of the uh, P addix. And um, if you look at all homotopy representations of any dimension, then they are uniquely a sum of such one dimensional homotopy representations, just characters uh, with um, indexed by p adic numbers. So in this particular case, the ordinary representations include into the uh, homotopy representations. Um, and yeah, I said what the image is. So now let's look at some more complicated uh, Lie groups. Let's uh, take a compact Lie group G and let T be the maximal torus and look at the maximal torus normalizer N of T inside of G. So the normalizer is, um, uh, sits inside a short exact sequence. So of course the maximal torus is inside of it and it's a normal subgroup by the definition of a normalizer and the quotient is what's called the vial group um, of, of that Lie group. And uh, Tilman, it looks like, yeah. Uh, Ian, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. I was just waiting for an opening. Um, sorry, just to make sure that I'm not uh, losing my mind. When you say P completion everywhere, it's uh, smashing with the P complete sphere, right? Or is um, there something else that you mean? Yeah, I mean the H, I mean the, uh, the localization at, um, at homology with FP coefficients. So if your space of, is finite type, then that is just smashing with the P complete sphere. Okay, but if it isn't, then okay, cool. Thanks. Yes. Well, the examples that I have are of finite types. So. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so you have this short exact sequence, and the vial group, of course, um, is uh, well the well-known vial group of 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 a Lie group. It's uh, it's a finite group of reflections acting on the maximal torus uh, by reflections, and um, yeah, the the extension that we have is the is the normalizer instead of a T. So let's look at a baby case, or a, a simple case here, and suppose that the prime that we're looking at does not divide the order of the Weil group. So, um, you know, those Weil groups tend to be uh, something like symmetric groups. So that usually means that the prime is just large enough. Um, bigger than, than a certain number and for all the smaller ones it won't work. So let's suppose that we are in this non-modular case, um, then the inclusion of the classifying space of the maximal torus normalizer into BG, that is um, an equivalence after P completion. So uh, to mod P cohomology, those uh, two spaces look exactly the same, although the dimension of the normalizer um, is much smaller than a dimension of, of G, right? G has some dimension, the torus has a much smaller dimension, just the rank, and the maximal torus normalizer has the same dimension because it's an extension of that uh, with a finite group. So, but still they have the same cohomology and when the proof is sort of a one-liner, um, both of these in the non-modular case, the cohomology rings are just the invariance of the cohomology of the maximal torus under the Weil group action. Um, in the case of the maximal torus normalizer, this is just uh, the, um, the homotopy orbit um, spectral sequence. And in the case of the Lie group, this is sort of classical stuff from compact Lie groups. So I guess I just wrote down an isomorphism, but the actual inclusion induces that isomorphism. Um, so if P doesn't divide the order of the Weil group in this simple case, we thus know that the homotopy representations of G are the same as the homotopy representations of the maximal torus normalizer. Um, so we've reduced down to some smaller groups. Uh, moreover, um, as I maybe mentioned in passing before, um, the classifying space of the maximal torus normalizer is actually just the homotopy orbits of the value group action on the maximal torus. Um, and uh, so that means, well, up to, up to P completion in any case. Um, and that means that the homotopy uh, representations of G 
only the same as the homotopy representations of the maximal torus normalizer. They're also just the invariants of the um, representations, homotopy representation of the maximal torus under the value group action. So you have a homotopy representation, uh, which is a map from Bt to Bun, and then you have an element of the value group, which acts by precomposition on such a representation. And if you look at the fixed points of, of, that, uh, of that action, then you, then you get the uh, homotopy representations of the maximal torus normalizer. Again, this is, uh, um, if you want a homotopy, uh, homotopy orbit uh, spectral sequence. Um, so that's, that's fairly simple. That reduces the problem to just computing some invariance. Um, and let's do a very concrete example. Let's look at group SU2, the simplest um, non-abelian uh, positive dimensional Lie group, I would say. And let's take a prime that's odd. Why do I take any prime that's odd? Well, because the value group is um, the symmetric group on two elements, the sacred group of order two. And um, so for P not to divide that, P has to be an odd prime. The maximal torus is of course just a circle and the value group acts on the circle by complex conjugation. Uh, the maximal torus normalizer uh, can you guess what that will be? An extension of S1 by C2. I guess you don't ask questions in this format, do you? Okay. Well, it's not O2. Um, it's pin 2. It's a different extension. I'll get to that a little later. But it's the, it's the group pin 2. So, uh, the homotopy representations of SU2 are just the homotopy representations of S1, fixed points under this uh, involution, the C2 involution. Well, how does the C2 involution act on these irreducible homotopy representations, on these, on these characters that are indexed by two adic numbers or p adic numbers? Well, they send rho L, which has degree L, to rho minus L, not surprisingly. So the irreducible representations of, of SU2 for odd primes are, well, of course, the trivial one-dimensional representation, which is invariant under this action. And then for the, then you have two-dimensional representations, which um, are a sum of rho L and rho minus L. That's the only thing you can do. Just call them, gonna call those rho plus minus L. And rho plus minus one is going to be your standard representation, the two-dimensional vector representation of SU2. And um, yeah, and the other ones are uh, other, other two-dimensional representations. So that's all you have in that case for odd primes. So, um, <clears throat> so general, this sort of argument computes the reduces the computation of homotopy representations to just computing invariant characters. Characters by characters, I just mean representations of a torus um, under the value group action. Um, but the situation gets much more complicated, much more interesting in the more common case that the prime does divide the order of the value group, and this is what I want to focus on uh, in the rest of this talk. Um, so um, there are certain groups that take the role of P subgroups or P groups in the setting of, um, of Lie groups. Um, those are the P toral groups. So a group is called P toral if it's an extension of a finite P group by a torus. Uh, so you can have S1s and you can have finite P groups. You can have, you can have extensions of these. So those are the P toral groups. Um, the maximal torus normalizer is an extension of the torus by a finite group, but in general, of course, not by, the, by a finite P group. But there's always a natural thing to do, and that is to take, if you have the I group W, you could take the, um, actually, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. So um, if you take the, 
if you take the Weil group and you, you pick a silo subgroup of this, of course, that's a choice that you make. Um, then you can, can take the pre-image of the silo subgroup in the maximal torus normalizer, and then you get something that I call the p-normalizer of the maximal torus. And that is going to be a p-toral group. That is a p-toral subgroup of G. So that's a, that's a very natural thing to do. And in, in a way, that's the, well, that is a maximal p-toral subgroup of, uh, of your group G. Um, <clears throat> much like as I showed before with S1, which has a discrete approximation, so, um, so has every p toral group also a discrete approximation. And um, you can basically get that, well, so basically what you want to do is you want to replace the torus by um, the classifying space of, or, sorry, I forgot a B here, so the B of the torus should be a B of QP mod ZP, such as Z, you want to replace every S1 by a Z mod P to the infinity. And the torus is n-dimensional, then you want to do this and take n copies of this. So um, you can show that there's a unique such um, uh, subgroup, P check, that is discrete and um, fits into this exact sequence here. And what's so special about these p-toral groups? Well, this is a theorem of, by Dwyer and Zabrotsky that said that um, the comparison map that takes an actual representation to a homotopy representation is actually an isomorphism in this case. So every homotopy representation of p comes from an actual representation of this discrete approximation. Um, and in a way, these are sort of the the maximal class of groups where this C is an isomorphism in this way. This is the best you can do. I guess I should leave some more space for questions. I, are there questions so far? And as a reminder, people should not be afraid to interrupt when they have questions. That's just how we do it here. Um, yeah. It's not rude to interrupt. It's just, that's just, that's just how it works. Very good. Yes. So, and of course the homotopy representations of P and the homotopy representations of P check, those will also be the same because uh, these two groups have the same P completion. P completion of uh, P check will be P. Uh, well, if the torus was P complete, otherwise the P completions are the same. So let's, let's do an example. Let's do let, Let's look at the previous example again. No, let's not look. Let's take. Um, it's almost the previous example. Let's the prime two. Let's take the prime two, and let's consider this group pin two that I mentioned before. And this is a non-split extension of S one with C two. The O two is a split extension. There's another one. There's only two extensions that are not two non-trivial extensions. Um, and pin two is the other uh, extension. Um, so this is a, um, well, you know the, the spin groups and uh, the spin groups are the special groups, the groups of determinant one inside of the pin groups and pin two is uh, the one of rank two. So um, this is actually the, as I said, this is the silo subgroup, the maximal torus normalizer. I sometimes call the maximal torus normalizer the silo subgroup because that's kind of the role it plays uh, for compact Lie groups. So this actually is the silo subgroup of SU2. This is the maximal torus, the two P, P, yeah, P normalizer of the maximal torus of SU2. Um, question? So then what is, the, what is the discrete approximation of pin two? Well, that is going to be an infinite generalized quaternion group. So um, what is, you, you know the quaternion group, it has uh, uh, generators i, j, and k. Actually, it's, it's enough to just take i and j because k is the product and they both have order four and i squared and i squared and j squared are minus one. Uh, they have order four. Now a generalized quaternion group, you let i still have, or let, let you let j still have order four, but i can have um, an order, any power of two. 
That's a generalized quaternion group. So the irreducible representations in this case of PIN2, they are, um, by the dwight zabrowski theorem, the same as the representations of that uh, infinite generalized quaternion group. And what you get is that the representations are either one-dimensional, then you get the trivial uh, representation, and of course, uh, this map here, the determined map, um, gives you another one-dimensional representation. And all the other representations are induced up from S1, and they're going to be of this form rho plus minus L. So when you restrict those back to S1, you get rho L plus rho minus L. Um, so that's sort of similar to the odd primary case. So <clears throat> why are we interested in these Toro groups other than they that they have a good uh, representation theory? Well, it wouldn't be so helpful if the story stopped there. But there's a big theorem by Jatzkowski, McClure, and Oliver from 92, and they showed that you can decompose the classifying space of any Lie group, at least up to P completion, um, into classifying spaces of such P toral subgroups. You can write them as a co-limit of uh, such guys. It's not going to be a directed co-limit. It's going to be a more complicated co-limit, homotopy co-limit. Um, but I'm going to tell you exactly what, what kind of co-limit it is and what the indexing category will look like. So we're going to need a, another definition. So we, we say that a pictorial subgroup, so now it's important where uh, this group lies. Um, so a pictorial subgroup uh, P and G is called P radical. An older name for this is P stubborn, but um, the finite group theorists used P radical, so we, we adopted this um, a while ago. If the normalizer of it, modulo P, so the vial group of P inside of G, is finite and doesn't have any non-trivial normal P subgroups. So it's okay to have P subgroups. It's okay if the order, if P divides the order, but it can't have any normal P subgroups. So that's a bit of a... Um, funny condition. Um, but these are um, sort of the, the crucial P subgroups inside of a group G. So an example is that, you know, pseudo subgroups are always P radical. Um, that's not hard to see. Um, let's look at the maximal torus. Let's check out the maximal torus is a P toral subgroup just, that just happens to have a um, uh, yeah, that, that doesn't have a, a discrete part that's connected. So when is the maximal torus P radical? Well, that means that the Val group, so the maximal torus normalizer module of the torus is of course just the Val group, um, it shouldn't have any non-trivial normal P subgroup. So if we look at the family of uh, unitary groups, special unitary groups, of course the the Weil group of the special unitary group is a symmetric group on n letters. And um, so the symmetric group on two letters has, of course, a uh, non trivial normal two subgroup. It is a two uh, subgroup, it is a two group. Um, S3, the symmetric group on three letters, does not have a, a normal two subgroup. So that's fine. Then it, it, it will be too radical for SU3, but not for SU2. If you look at S4, uh, the symmetric group on four letters, so now it's you're getting into a bit of sort of baby finite group theory. Um, S4 has a normal subgroup isomorphic to the Klein Fear group, Klein 4 group. So uh, that is not too radical. And then, of course, S5, from S5 on, um, you can show that there can't be any uh, normal uh, uh, two subgroup, basically because there's an index two subgroup A5, which is simple. So that precludes that. So just illustrative example. But for SU2, we see that the maximum torus isn't too radical. Let's look at a slightly more complicated example, and these are the, the generalized quaternion groups. 
So these are generated as a subgroup of SU2 by two kinds of matrices. First, you have a rotation matrix here of order four. And then you have a matrix that has a root of unity in here. So this is two nth root of unity. So for instance, if n is two, then you have i and minus i here on the diagonal. And then this is exactly one a representation of the quaternion group of order eight as a matrix group. Um, but if you take um, if you take higher um, roots of unity, then this is a, a group of order four n. These are the generalized quaternion groups. So, and then you can play around with this a little bit and compute the normalizer of these guys in SU two, and you find that the normalizer of Q four n is actually just isomorphic to Q four n plus one when n is at least three. So you can see that um, the the matrices that have a root of C, uh, of um, of zeta on the diagonal that these will still normalize the subgroup. So um, and of course the two groups. So two group ha always has a two. Uh, um, a, um, those are not two groups, but, but they don't have, um, they have a two, uh, a two subgroup, normal two subgroup. Um, but for n equals two, something, something different happens for n, for the normalizer of Q8, this is not a group of order 16, as you would expect. It's a group of order 48. There's an additional matrix that, uh, normalizes this that has order three. And uh, if you look at the normalizer, of, if you look at this group modulo Q8, you get the group S3. And S3, as I said, uh, does not have a normal two subgroup. So Q8 is too radical. So we've classified all the two radical subgroups of SU2. Well, I'm, I guess I'm waving my hands a little bit here that there are no others. But the two radical subgroups of SU2 are precisely conjugate to pin two or to Q8, just those two. Or groups conjugate to them. Okay. okay. So, and then the theorem that I mentioned, or that I uh, said I would mention, um, by Jatzkowski, McClure, and Oliver, says that um, BG is a co-limit of such BPs. So let me tell you what category the co-limit goes over. So we're looking at the category whose objects are orbits cosets G mod P for P radical subgroups of G and the morphisms of G maps. So this is a, this is a full subcategory of the orbit category where we only look at the orbits with respect to P radical subgroups. And then they say, well, if you take the homotopy co-limit over this category of uh, BP, there's a natural map to BG, and that map is an FP equivalence. So if you P complete both sides, that's a homotopy equivalence. Is the statement of this clear? So what about this category RP of G, this category, this orbit category? It's equivalent in the sense that, well, category for equivalence, it's skeleton, is a finite EI category. EI means all endomorphisms are isomorphisms. Um, it's a category that, that has a direction. If there's a morphism from A to B, then there can't be a morphism from B to A unless the two are isomorphic. And if it's a skeletal category, then you can't have isomorphic unequal objects. So um, <clears throat> it's a finite, category uh, where all endomorphisms are isomorphisms. So I'm going to show you an example in a second. And the automorphisms in that category of such an object, G mod P, they are precisely those, those value groups, the normalizers of P modulo P. Uh, those things that we required were finite and had no uh, non-trivial normal P subgroups. And they are subgroups of the outer automorphisms of P. Sometimes they're all of the outer automorphisms of P, actually quite often they're all of the outer 
automorphisms of P, but in general, they are a subgroup of those. So the example that we looked at for the prime two, we said that there are two, two radical subgroups, pin two and Q8. And we also said, we also computed the automorphisms of this, and I said that this was S3. So we have an S3 acting on uh, the classifying, classifying space of Q8, and you can imagine how that acts. It permutes i, j, and k, the, the three uh, quaternionic generators. And there are no, there are no non-trivial endomorphisms of B pin two. So the homotopy co-limit, two completed homotopy co-limit of this little diagram, which uh, just has two objects and one uh, morphism between different objects and just an S3 worth of um, uh, autom automorphisms of one of the objects, that is uh, BSU2, to complete it. So let's go back to representations. So if we think about, uh, we, this, is the, this is what we want to compute, and now we've decomposed BG as a homotopy co-limit over this category. So of course there's a map from the limit of these homotopy classes into there, but um, that's not always an equivalence. Um, if we looked at the mapping space from the whole cone limb, then that would be the homotopy limit of the mapping spaces, but um, that doesn't give, an, give us an isomorphism of, on pi naught in general. So there's a spectral sequence involving higher limits that would compute uh, this side in terms of this side at higher limits. But these higher limits are very often zero, surprisingly often zero in these cases of representations. Um, I don't think there's a general theorem that tells you um, that uh, the limits are always zero in particular cases, but whenever we uh, compute something, either the higher limits are zero or uh, the spectral sequence doesn't give any obstruction to uh, lifting something from here to here. Um, so I'm not going to focus on this in this talk. Um, instead, I'm going to look at um, these kind of representations. So let's give those a name. Let's call those invariant representations. Let's call an invariant representation of G just an element in this limit, just uh, a compatible uh, set of representations of all the p-radical subgroups. And let's just pretend that all of these uniquely extend to homotopy representations. This is true in many cases, uh, for, many diff um, um, for many cases of Lie groups G. All right, let's look at this again, the example that we had uh, with SU2, the toy example that I think is sort of informative for the general case. Um, then we know that the, in the irreducible representations of pin two, we computed those. Those are the trivial representation the determinant representations, and those two-dimensional representations, rho plus minus L. What are the representations of Q8? Uh, so this is a quaternion group of order eight, and um, it has a trivial representation. Um, it has three other one-dimensional representations that I'm, I'm calling kappa i, kappa j, and kappa k, and they're defined, so kappa i sends i to one, but j and k to minus one and kappa j sends j to one and i and k to minus one. Uh, and those are one dimensional representations of, of Q8. Um, and then there's the standard representation that I'm going to call theta, which is of dimension two, and this just comes from the inclusion of Q8 into, into SU2. Um, so those are the irreducible representations of Q8. And now we need to know how they restrict. Well, no, we also need to know how S3 acts on those. And not surprisingly, it commutes kappa i, kappa j, and uh, kappa k, but it fixes the trivial representation and the, and the standard representation. So those are, those are invariant. And now we also need to understand the restriction of representations from uh, pin two to Q8. And with a little bit of computation, you see that, well, the trivial representation restricts to the trivial representation. 
the determinant will restrict to kappa i. Um, the row L's where L is odd will restrict to theta. The row L's where four divides L restrict to a, a copy of the trivial representation and kappa i. And when the index is two mod four, then these restrict to kappa j plus kappa k. So reasonably complicated, but in a way, every representation has to occur as a summand of a restriction of a larger one. So um, yeah, we shouldn't expect two simple formulas for the restrictions. So those are the restrictions again. And now we can sort of figure out what the invariance ones are. Well, of course, uh, the trivial representation is always invariant, clearly. Um, the determinant representation is not invariant because kappa i would be sent to kappa j and kappa k under the S3 action, but, but that's, those are not summons of the restriction of de the determinant. But these rho plus minus odd, these two-dimensional ones, those are, those are invariant representations of dimension two, complex dimension two. Now see, if you take one of, one of those guys here, kappa j plus kappa k, so those, and you add the determinant representation, then the restriction is going to be kappa i plus kappa j plus kappa k, and that's invariant. So that's a, that's a representation of dimension three. Let me tell you, what, tell, tell you what the representation that is. SU2 is a double cover of SO3. SO3 has a real three-dimensional representation. And if you complexify that, you get a three-dimensional representation of SU2. And that's that one for L equals to zero. And then there's a two-parameter family of four-dimensional representations where you take one of those supplying a trivial factor and a kappa i, and then one of those that's supplying a kappa j and a kappa k. And that's all of them. So um, all of these invariant representations do lift uniquely to homotopy representations. So there's no obstructions getting in the way. Um, but this example is misleading in, 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 a, in several ways. So um, here we've identified indecomposable representations. And the nice thing about representations of finite groups is that the category is semi-simple. So every uh, representation decomposes uniquely into uh, indecomposables. But that's not true for uh, homotopy representations. Homotopy representations do not, in general, decompose uniquely into indecomposables. Um, they do in the case of SU2, but that's a very rare case. Another thing is um, here we see that the dimension of the indecomposables is bounded. So there are two dimensional, three dimensional, and four dimensional indecomposables, and none of higher dimension. And that's maybe a little surprising because SU2, if you look at the, the, the classical representation theory, um, has irreducible representations in any dimension. But they decompose if you hit, hit them with that uh, comparison factor. But the fact that the dimension of the indecomposables is bounded is, again, uh, not a general feature of homotopy representations. That is not going to happen for, for bigger league groups. So um, it was relatively easy to do this invariant computation for SU2, and you can do it for small groups, and has been done for small groups. But so the overall structure of what these representations look like is very much a mystery. So we're still at the point where we can compute some examples, uh, but we wouldn't be able to compute them like for all the SUNs or, or any other infinite family, in fact. Um, so the overall structure of these is um, pretty much mysterious. So <clears throat> of course, the first step of doing this is to classify the p-radical subgroups. And Oliver, in a paper from 92, did this for all the classical Lie groups. So the SONs, spin ends, uh, SUNs, um, SPNs, uh, and that's it. Yeah. So um, that's been done. And then, of course, you can look at the exceptional ones and uh, 
get into hairy computations. All right. Um, questions so far, because now I'm going to talk about P compact groups. Do you know if all of those higher limits? Vanish? I can't hear you. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, do you know if all of those higher limits vanish for classical Lie groups? Mm, um, no. Uh, I, I don't. They don't vanish. I mean, there are, there are certainly examples where the higher limits don't vanish. If you're asking, is there any invariant representation that doesn't live to, a, uh, to an actual homotopy representation? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think that's, I'm not sure, I don't think that's known. Okay, thanks. But the obstruction groups are definitely sometimes non-zero. But whether the obstructions are sometimes non-zero, I don't know. All right, so now let's uh, generalize this a little bit because, well, we kind of understand representations of compact Lie groups. Why would we do homotopy representations that seem to be more complicated? Well, because there are other objects that don't have actual representations. So p-compact groups, they are like things that look to mod p homology like Lie groups. So the definition is very short deceivingly short, it's just a p-complete pointed and connected space BG with the property that if you take the loop space, which we're going to call G, it should have a totally finite FP homology. So all the homology groups are finite dimensional and there are only finitely many of them. Uh, that's, that's a p-compact group. Um, so of course, <clears throat> if you take a Lie group, let's say a connected Lie group, uh, then that's an example if you p-complete it in classifying space. But uh, there are other examples, and that's where, where the interest lies. And they were studied in depth in, in the 1990s, uh, first and foremost by Brian Wilkerson but, and, and, and some other people. And um, p-completions of Lie groups are an example, as I said. If your Lie group is not connected, then you have to be a little careful with what the group of components is, and it has to be a p-group for it to be. Uh, for, um, for it to be a, a p-compact group. And um, so this is basically one long bullet point that tells you uh, about 10 years of, of studies of, of p-compact groups and that says that, well, they're basically homotopically indistinguishable from, from compact Lie groups. They have maximal tori, uh, there's, there's up to conjugacy unique maximal torus inside of those. They have Val groups. These Val groups are not necessarily reflection groups, but they are complex reflection groups, so or pseudo reflection groups. So a re reflection group is generated by elements of order two that fix a hyperplane. A complex reflection group is generated by elements that fix a hyperplane but have any finite order. Um, um, they have these uh, homotopy decompositions by p toral subgroups, like I showed for, uh, uh, for Lie groups. Um, this was shown by Castellana, Levy, and Nordbohm in 2007. Um, they can be given a smooth structure. So you can find a smooth manifold whose p completion uh, is that compact Lie group. This was shown by Pedersen, Eric Pedersen and me in uh, 2006. Uh, but of course, the group structure, the loop structure, can't be rigidified on that smooth manifold. So they are not Lie groups. And there's a complete classification which was completed by Anderson and Rodal for the prime two in 2008, but sort of there were a bunch of other works uh, leading up to this. And the, the classification of these p compact groups goes along the lines of the classification of complex reflection groups. So one thing that they don't have is a Lie algebra. Uh, and that's, um, or, or an adjoint representation. So that's sort of a, something that's, that's really bugging us who uh, try to work with these p-compact groups. They, they, they seem to refuse to have a proper representation theory. Um, and of course, we can define homotopy representations, but we can't really define actual representations, finite dimensional representations of these. So, uh, So let's do an example, just so that you, you see one example of a p-compact group, although that's not the one that I'm going to look at. So let's take an odd prime. 
And then if you look at the p-adic units, we have a maximal finite subgroup, which is a cyclic group of order p minus one. And that group of uh, order p minus one acts on the p completion of CP infinity. Now the p completion of CP infinity is just a, a einberg maclean space for the p-adics in degree two. And the p-adic units just act on that. So we can take the homotopy orbit space of this, let's call that BS. And the homotopy orbit, the cohomology of that homotopy orbit space is going to be a polynomial algebra, but X lies in degree twice P minus one. Sort of atoms like split. So that means that if you take the loop space of this, which I'm going to call S, it's going to be uh, uh, a two P minus three dimensional sphere. Right, uh, x is in degree p minus two. If we take the loops, it's a polynomial algebra. So the Einberg Mohr spectral sequence, for instance, tells you that um, the cohomology of the loop space will be an exterior algebra, um, and it's simply connected, so it's a sphere. Um, when p is three, that's just the the three completion of SU two. But for larger primes, this is really a new object. This is not the p completion of a Lie group. So that's, these are called the Sullivan spheres. I should have written the name Sullivan in there. So these are the Sullivan spheres. What I think is the most interesting P-compact group of all uh, is also the only exotic one that exists at the prime two. And this is a group called, uh, that I wanna call G3 now because it has some analogs to G2. So, um, you have the infinite families and then you have the exotic Lie groups, but some of these exotic Lie groups have partners that are p-compact groups. And G2 has a partner, G3, as a two-compact group. Some people call this also DI4 or DW3. And this was discovered by Dwyer Wilkerson in, uh, in a paper from 1993. So it can be characterized in the sense that it's uniquely determined by its cohomology ring. And the cohomology, is um, the invariance of um, a polynomial ring in four generators under the full general linear group uh, of rank four over F2. This is called the Dixon algebra, the Dixon algebra of, uh, of rank four. And uh, if you do the invariant theory, then you see that you will have four generators in degrees eight, 12, 14, and 15. In general, the Dixon algebras have generators in degrees two to the n minus two to the i, where i is less than n. So that's the ring of Dixon invariance. And um, if you did this one rank down, you took uh, GL3 of F2, then you would get the cohomology of G2. Um, and if you did one rank up, then you can show that such a space can't exist. So that's the last one that um, has the cohomology of Dixon. Yeah has the cohomology ring, the Dixon invariance. So it has dimension 45, has a rank three, but the two rank is four. So it has a elementary abelian subgroup of, uh, of, of, uh, of rank four, an elementary abelian two subgroup of rank four, but a torus only of rank three inside of it. And its Weil group is uh, an interesting Weil group. It's a product of the simple group of order 168, that's the second simple group. Well, apart from the alternating groups. Well, okay. It's a simple group. Um, uh, product of that with, with just a, a copy of the cyclic group of order two. Order 336. Um, and it has spin seven as a full rank subgroup. So it has, it has spin seven as a subgroup. Spin seven also has rank three. Um, so that means that the quotient G3 modulo spin seven is a complex, well, it looks like a complex manifold, except it's too complete. And that will, is a, uh, looks like a manifold of dimension 24 and Euler characteristic seven. Um, so that, that's probably a, an interesting homogeneous space to study, but not for this talk. So, um, <clears throat> let's say what we mean by an adjoint representation. So let's say that a homotopy representation of a P-compact group 
could be a Lie group um, of dimension n and rank r, rank r is called an adjoint representation if it has the right weights. And that means that the restriction to the maximal torus decomposes into, um, into an r dimensional trivial representation corresponding to the maximal torus and characters, dimensional representations corresponding to all the, the roots. And the roots, of course, are you know, defined by these reflections. Uh, pseudo reflection group is reflections along certain uh, vectors, and these vectors are the roots. So that classifies you know, adjoint representation for Lie group has that property, and that is a good thing to, if you have constructed a representation, to see whether that might be called an adjoint representation or not. And Salia Castellana in the 1990s showed that all simple P compact groups have adjoint representations, with one exception. She couldn't show that G3 has an adjoint representation. And then quite a bit later, uh, Zimjanski um, argues in his thesis that G3 actually does not have an adjoint representation. Um, and in, uh, a, 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 a later he published a paper and constructed a representation, any representation of C3. There was no known representation of C3 at all. Um, and he constructed one of that dimension, two to the order of 46, which is uh, this number. So it's a fairly large uh, representation. And this is the smallest non-trivial representation we know to date. Um, we don't know any, any smaller, smaller representation, which is um, surprising. Um, and all the others have a representation in their dimension. So um, I set out and did a bit of computing here and to just you know, dampen your expectations. I haven't found uh, a good representation yet. So I wish I could present this to you now, but I have some preliminary results that maybe still are interesting. So this is the, this is this fusion category. This is this category of uh, P radical subgroups. So there's a bunch of them. And um, most of the groups you recognize, uh, the, the gamma groups are extra special groups. They're um, extra special two groups. They're not very hard. Um, and you see a lot of these star products, and these are graded commutative central products over a common normal uh, group of order two. And, uh, and, and, and these groups here, these are lifts of subgroups of ON to spin N. So this is the category for spin seven, which I said is a subgroup. Let's check the time. OK, good. Um, the category for G3 contains the category of spin seven as a full subcategory, but it has some additional objects. Um, yeah, let me just skip over this. Um, so the invariant representations of G3 are going to inject into the invariant representations of spin seven. But how can we effectively compute these? All right. So general setup of how we, how we can do this. Let's uh, assume that you have a certain finite set of p radical subgroups of a group G. And let's assume that the first one is the silo subgroup, the maximal one. And then let's uh, just enumerate all the irreducible representations of all of these groups. Let's call this rho i1 through rho i n i. And there might be maybe a varying number of one depending on which group you're on. Now, we're interested in the restriction maps from P1 to all of these PIs, and you can describe these restrictions by a matrix by basically saying, well, if I restrict from P1 to Pj, one of these representations, then I get uh, a number of other representations. I decided to index my matrix with uh, a pair of elements that you can give the lexicographic order and another element. So you have these numbers here. Right? They give you a matrix. And um, every invariant orbit, so if you look at one of your group's PI, then your group acts and you can, you can decompose all of your rep irreducible representations into orbits, invariant orbits. And if you uh, produce a vector that contains minus ones for all the entries that uh, irreducible representations that occur in one orbit and zeros otherwise, um, then, then you get uh, you know, a bunch of vectors, one for every orbit and every um, every PI. 
why do I set a minus one in there? Because if I take that matrix that consists of that matrix, that restriction matrix and that invariance matrix, then the positive integer solutions to Bx equals zero, so vectors x that consist of positive integers or non-negative integers, they correspond exactly to the invariant representations of G. Basically, you want to take a certain linear combination of the representations of P1, and then you look at all the restrictions, but all the restrictions have to be, uh, have to occur in some orbit. So that means, that, um, okay, there's one caveat, the set of irreducible representations of these PI is actually infinite in our cases when the group is infinite, even uncountable. Um, but much like p toral groups, you can approximate these things by discrete subgroups. So for instance, G3 can be approximated by uh, a group that I might call G3 to the n, which has maximal torus, not actually a torus, but Z mod two to the n to the order three but to the power of three. Um, so the problem of computing invariant representations becomes an algebra problem. Given an integer matrix A, find the minimal non-negative non-zero integer vectors satisfying AX equals zero, and optimally also additive relations between them. So that would give you a complete understanding of the, of the solution set. And such a set is called a graver basis, and people have sort of people in computational commutative algebras, algebra have done a lot with this, and there are fairly efficient ways of computing these using Grobner basis uh, algorithms. Um, but they're not efficient enough for G3 or spin seven. These are too large. So I used another approach to this, and that doesn't give you all the reducible representations, but it gives you the smallest one and some other irreducibles. And that is um, using integer linear programming. So the problem here is given an integer matrix A and a non-negative integer vector V, find the minimal vectors X that are greater component-wise greater or equal than V such that AX equal to zero. And this is something that can be done very efficiently and very scales very well um, using linear programming. And then if you let V run through all the standard basis vectors corresponding to the irreducible representations of P1, so you're looking for minimal irreduce, the minimal representations containing the first irreducible, the second irreducible, the third irreducible, and so on, then you get irreducible representations for every single one, possibly with repetitions, and the smallest dimensional is guaranteed to be among them. So, Using this computational framework, um, you can show that these discrete approximations have non-trivial invariant representations of order two to the n minus two times 45. So 45 is the dimension for an adjoint representation that you would really like. We don't have those for any n greater or equal than three. Um, for n equals three, we get one of dimension 90, and the next one is going to be of dimension 180, and the next one is going to be of I mentioned 360, and for up to there, these are actually the smallest dimensional representations that exist, period. So in particular, the two compact group G3 does not have a non-trivial invariant representation of dimension less than 360. Now, the obvious question, of course, is where between 360 and 2 to the power of 46 is the truth? Where do we have the smallest representation? And that is not a question that that I can answer yet. But, um, I hope I, I will make some progress in this. Another thing that I think is maybe more relevant, sort of takes a bit of the edge of this, this disappointment is to look for spherical uh, representations, spherical vibrations instead of linear representations and see if you can find an adjoint representation there. And that I am very confident that uh, that, that should exist, I think. All right, thanks very much. Okay, I'm gonna uh, mute everyone so that we can thank him. And we'll open it up for questions. To you, you.
there. Tillman, I have a question for you. Yes. So years ago, um, George Lustig and then Michel Bruet and various people uh, described representations for things that wanted to be Lie groups, but were associated out of here. We're associated to complex reflection groups. Okay. Um, they go by the name of spetses and strange things like this. And I always felt that there was a marriage ready to be made here. Uh -huh. We had the geometric objects. We had the compact groups. Right. And they had the representations, but they didn't know what they were representations of. And I'm okay. just wondering if that uh, marriage has been pursued at all in the years since then. Not that I'm aware of. I don't think so. This is Bruet and who? So uh, George Lustig worked Lustig. this out for the, one of the very simplest uh, non-vile um, uh, complex reflection groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then Michel Bruet and many other people uh, worked with him on this kind of project. And in the cases we know, those those correspond to representations of the. Uh, I don't. Are, I don't know more than I, what I've just said. It, one one thing is that they're always interested in complex reflection groups, whereas the things that show up in p-compact groups are p-adic reflection groups. So there's a slight sure. difference there. That, sure. Thanks. I um, I don't I don't think people have looked at this. I certainly haven't. Okay. Other questions. Okay, if not, we'll unmute everyone again and thank him one last time. Okay, and a couple of uh, quick announcements. We'll meet again in two weeks. Um, and also if people have links to online seminars, I'm collecting a list of uh, creating a webpage with links to online seminars. So you feel free to email me any suggestions you have for that list. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.